Grand-rising. My friends, what it look like for those who ride with me, the most beautiful subscribers in this solar system. We're going to be soon to be in this galaxy. We have some. We have some aspirations. And for those who are new, Sabona. The market looks much better for stocks and crypto and almost everything across the board. Mortgage rates are down at 1.75. It's just not it's not it's not a bad time right now if you invest in it. It's never a bad time. Um time in the market is Better than time in the market. And that means just putting money in, letting it ride for years is much better than trying to, oh, it's going down, take it out and oh, put it in. You just want to put a, you know, whatever it is, a set amount or some amount on a consistent basis. So that's what dollar cost averaging it is. Similar, same amounts on a consistent basis over time. Um you know, and you can either decide to, you know, I was discussing this with, I forgot who the, recently about either spreading out your risk, you know, pick, picking different assets to invest in, or if you feel super confident in one thing, but, you know, that's a higher risk, higher reward in that regard. So you have to decide what's best for you. Bitcoin is at 44,000. Let's just refresh and see if. Has changed anything or it's still the same? Forty-four thousand five hundred nine dollars. Ethereum at three thousand one hundred four. Cardano at two dollars and thirty-one cents. Binance Coin three hundred seventy-seven dollars. XRP at ninety, <clears throat> almost ninety-nine cents. Solana at one hundred forty-six dollars and fifty-three cents. Was Travel down a little further. Cosmos at forty-one dollars. Cosmos up ten percent over the week versus others. You know, Cosmos Avalanche continues to do well. Seventy-four dollars and fifty-eight cents. Cosmo forty-one twenty-seven. Tron at a shade under ten cents. Tezo six dollars and twenty-nine cents. Pretty good. Ten percent on the day. Have to respect that. Oh wow. Oh no. Okay. I thought I went further. Algorand at a dollar ninety six. Still okay. Still has a higher market cap then, because this is here. I have my. Uh, you can see this is uh, by market cap. It goes down by market cap. Bitcoin with the highest market cap. So you know that's why. In what order is this in by market cap for um, the rankings? And you can well, you know, I guess yeah by rankings I guess. And then we can see that Algorand is at about you know, 11,000 versus Cosmos 9. And if it was to 10 times, Cosmos would get, you know, be above where Cardano is today. But then each one would be worth $410, so a 10x. So that's when you look at about 10x or 100x, which will have the, the, the legs to do that. So if anything is to get near Ethereum, say if one day... Tezos is equivalent to Ethereum today. Where are we at? Uh, I feel like I go past it? I'm going past it or something? Mm, let's go a little bit further. All right. Let's say the graph for IOTA. Say the graph is at 76 cents now. And if it was to 100x, so times 100. It's at 3.6 billion now times 100 would get you at 360. Like Ethereum today, the graph. Then each of these would be time would be $76. So 76 cents today would be $76 if if that happened, if it's a very huge operative work. And remember, none of this is financial advice. None of this is advice to be misconstrued in any shape, form, or fashion as anything besides listening for entertainment purposes. Shouldn't have to say that, but great googly muggly. Anyway, I'm not going to belabor the point on that much longer. Stock market is doing much better. 
today, Dow Jones was up 500 points, about uh, 1.5%. The S&P up 1.2%. The NASDAQ up 8%. A, not 8, if you mis misheard me in there. Everything looked pretty good. Better just to say who didn't. Home Depot and um, Coca-Cola were down, but by tiny amounts on the day. United Health, but for the most part, Salesforce was up 7%. JP Morgan, a bank up 3.38. And yes, if you didn't know, your banks are also traded as public companies on the stock market. And ETH burns. The ETH burns. Boy. This is, um, tell you, that's an important thing that's going to come back one day and, um, Really, we'll look back on that like, wow, it really things changed, and most people didn't even know. Most people don't even know what Ethereum is. We'll say most, probably still, probably majority don't know what Ethereum Not even talking about like what is Ethereum, but at, like Ethereum, what's that? <laughs> let alone a cryptocurrency, let alone a cryptocurrency that enables smart chain capability. I'm sorry, uh, smart contract capabilities on it. Let's pop into it, but we hear about that positivity and that positivity being there's someone in your life that's important. It may be, you know, reach out to them, say what's up via the comment sections under this video and then forward them the video and then they see it and it kind of just, then they do the same thing and it becomes a daisy chain of awesomeness for people to get this, you know, this knowledge or maybe not, you know. Try to marry knowledge and wisdom a bit. But let's get into it and do a bit of a history lesson about Satoshi Nakamoto at the same time. Huh? Hungary's Bitcoin fans unveil faceless statue of mysterious crypto founder Satoshi Nakamoto. And if you don't know, the individual who came up with the protocol, which is the, the program, and wrote a paper and was called a white paper and released it was this individual who went by the name satoshi nakamoto at the time they also were able to trace various forum accounts believe even a twitter account to this individual for a brief period when it was released in 2008 and 2009 um there are other individuals like hal finney who jumped in really quickly and started mining bitcoin i believe hal finney lived in florida and, and passed away not too long ago uh, there were other individuals I want to say it was the name Craig Wright, but he was involved early, you know, and argues that he is Satoshi Nakamoto, but has not been able to pr prove anything. It's, it appears to be, you know, allegedly in the court of law that goes that he's very litigious. And I know I'm a, I'm a small, small fry, but you never just want to be bothered with any garbage. Right. I think Satoshi Nakamoto is not one person, but. Probably an offshoot of DARPA, which is Defense Advanced Research Project Agency for the United States government. But who knows? Because, like I said, this individual has or individuals never came forward. The individuals who people thought they were. And one guy got raided by the, pol by the police because they thought he was Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> and it's like, why are you raiding them for? You know, like, because. So. Bitcoin is decentralized and it's built that way. Decentralized to be used for and by the people. So that's, and then people talk about like, well, potential potentiality of Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever it is, or they are mined about a million Bitcoin. And that Bitcoin is, has never been seen or been moved. Now, you'd imagine you can go look at the blockchain and figure out exactly. And so that's, you know, some of the earlier Bitcoin, now a lot of Bitcoin probably from the early days, people were, you know, took it as a joke or didn't quite understand, um, made mistakes. And so it was lost. So and that goes to where the scarcity also is involved. And now you see the scarcity with Ethereum and the burning as well. Security is an important thing because most of this tech, what we have now in this world is in terms of our monetary policy is, you know, ever since we left the gold standard and not even the 
I forget the exact term, like federal gold standard, reserve standard, but the, the true gold standard, which is you had to have physical backing for everything that you claimed. Then it went to, well, you know, part of it can be on paper. So here in Hungary, they put the Hungary, the, uh, did you say which city in Hungary? Uh, uh, Budapest, that they uh, have the statue. It's pretty, I like it, sweet. You know what I mean? It, it, you know, it's faceless and, and polished enough that when you look at it, you see it reflected back at you of uh, and he in a hoodie, you know, that, you know, the anonymous type look. And I guess they thought that maybe Satoshi Nakamoto would step forward at this event, like, it is me here. I can show you how I, I'll create a new cryptocurrency in front of you. Like, how would you, well, you prove it by moving some of those old coins, having some of them and moving some of them. Um, and I think that's where they come at Craig Wright and say, hey, well, show us that you have access to these and that and it doesn't occur. But I haven't followed enough to be 100 percent like, you know, like I said, I do super litigious. So, hey, whatever, <laughs> you know, what I mean, 25 percent of El Salvador's population, 1.6 million citizens now use the Bitcoin wallet. Roughly 25% of the population are using a Bitcoin Shivo wallet, according to the president. In a tweet sent out, 1.6, I'm not going to butcher my, yeah, look, I butcher words. I forget all this stuff. I butcher words and, uh, you know, listen at your, listen, listen at your own, uh, uh, what's the word when they say that? The expression for that. Risk? Okay, listen at your own risk. Yeah, I guess. Listen at your own risk. But that's about 25% of the Salvadorian individuals are now banking. In it. And at one point, I think they said like 70% of the country, they believe, were unbanked before. 70% of El Salvador's working population was unbanked before adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. But digital assets have now permanently transformed financial geopolitics. And, you know, they got 30 bucks a piece for just signing up. So maybe people just like, just sign up and get that $30. Hey, send it to me. You, okay, you hate Bitcoin, that's fine. Hey, stick it to them. Get, get that money and send it to me. They bought the dip. El Salvador, uh, the president announced they bought 150 new Bitcoin or more Bitcoin. Now they hold 700 Bitcoin. So... El Salvador make, and making some moves. Talked about how they're paving the way for Cuba and Ukraine to begin to recognize and regulate cryptocurrencies. Speaking of which, it would have been smoother if, the, if it was at the top and it had said Cuba, but my bad. Cuba is one of the latest countries to authorize and regulate cryptocurrencies. It's a bit of an older article. It's probably almost close to a month because their law went into effect on September 15th. The Cuban resolution, which will come into force on September 15th, regulates the use of certain virtual assets and commercial transactions, as well as the licensing of providers of these services and operations related to financial blah, 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 blah. In other words, they're going to allow people to uh, use virtual assets in their transactions. That's awesome. They said it's already, this article just talks, it's already, you know, Cuba has a bit of a problem with inflation, like every other country. Some countries are worse than other, Venezuela, uh, Turkey, Argentina, to come to mind recently. But that uh, there's a, a strong kind of either coder or punk element in Cuba, that's using Bitcoin and they use devices off of via gift cards for online purchases. So they said they think about 10,000 uh, Cuban nationals are using Bitcoin, but it's, it, they said Bitcoins, which angers me. But we'll, we'll let that slide. So I thought it was written kind of a little bit weird. Some of these articles, I think, are written by um, artificial intelligence. I don't know if I don't, I'm not going to do the whole due diligence forensic analysis to determine 100 percent but some of the unless just we get into a world where the standard of using proper english and writing articles has gone down i mean you're supposed to be at an eighth grade level and some of this stuff is like no nah, this ain't even on any on any level dunny i gotta i gotta play mental gymnastics to figure out what i'm looking at ah, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, Cuba, 
a lot of countries. Ukraine appears to be. And, you know, getting off into what are we going to do in this world? This was awesome. I mean, look. Maybe this guy was born here and, you know, was raised and the programming hit in real good. But I love our military. <laughs> I have a lot of friends in the military and I want them to be safe. So I want them to have the best things at all times. And I want them to not just, to, you know, if we can get to a point where the military is more of a just a. Of, you know, we don't even have to send them to other countries. We just deal with the look like the nat nat natural disasters in our own country, unfortunately. But um, the ingenuity. Now, a some of what it the what it potentially leads to in terms of what the story leads to is not a good outcome, but. Well, let's get into it. I'm, I'll let you know what I'm thinking. United States Air Force Special. I probably can figure it out early too. You know, I've been kind of we've been kind of um, seeing all the breadcrumbs come together. The United States Air Force Special Operators are hustling to turn their biggest planes into flying boats. So they're going to take these giant C-130s, or do they call them? Yeah, MC-130s. I gotta find what what is the M in my Air Force Special Command. It's a, it's a super huge airplane. Like you ever seen the movies where they have like the big, where they have like the the vehicles parked in there, and they're the big rows where everybody's sitting. That famous picture of uh, I don't know if that was if that was not, but it may be of Hillary Clinton on the on the military plane with the glasses on. That may have been a C one thirty. I don't know hundred percent on that. You know, please you know look in and see what it is, but. It's a huge, 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 I believe, I believe they say it in here. MC-130 variants have supported U.S. military operations since the 1960s. The MC-130J is the latest version, is the backbone of AF Air Force Special Operation Command's fixed Air Force wing. The $110 million aircraft has advanced navigation radar systems that allow it to operate in unfriendly territory. But the MC-130J Commando 2 amphibious capabilities, C2, C2, A, 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 C, A, C, I don't know where to go call that, as the effort is called, will allow it to support operations at sea, in, and in near shore areas. So they're going to take the largest plans they got and put these, it appear to be, how do you say it, remove. Yeah, I think it's remo yeah, removable amphibious float modifications. So the biggest planes they got still land on runways. We can land it now in the sea, close to shores or out further in the water. So now you can, if boats are are, <clears throat> are um, either damaged or if for whatever reason I run in water, you can send planes out with, with backup equipment or bring people back and forth. And... You know, put it together with how Taiwan, I think we did an article about that or I read it. I don't know if I mentioned it on here or not, but that Taiwan was practicing landing and taking off on um, highways in their city. But I was thinking like, but y'all specifically designed some highways for that. You don't think that the Chinese are looking to target them at the exact same time they're targeting your uh, the main airports and stuff because they, they, the, the places you practice and, and design to take off and land in case the airports were damaged, yeah, we're going to destroy them as well. That would be how I would be thinking. But the United, United States, you know, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we're practicing how to take off and land on just highways, regularly designed highways. Uh, specifically, these were in Michigan that they were practicing on. So this is very similar in my mind is that they want to be able to take off and land. This is Air Force Special Operations, but I can't imagine we wouldn't be bringing Marine uh, detachments in as well of being able to use our almost entire force as uh, and big giant amphibious planes that can take off and land in the water uh, in the South China Sea and the over near uh, Taiwan and China as close as we need to get as well. So this is where I see that this plan is. And they mention it. And China also and Russia and Japan. Russia and Japan and China also uh, investing in these amphibious planes. 
So maybe this is, and, and you know, so my, my, my thought is we can't be ready to go to war because, and maybe that'd be why we, we would demonstrate this technology that we have. Supposedly that's going to be a game changing deterrent in terms of any uh, nation state that would think to compete with us besides what we already have. My thought is maybe the individuals who make money off of this, remember none of this is investment advice and you have to invest what you feel comfortable with, but if, if there's somewhat some validity, what I'm saying, that may be something to think about, which is these companies, Raytheon, General Atomic, um, Lockheed, Martin, Boeing, they want to make their money. And so now they made money for years in the Middle East throwing these bomb detecting things, starting the whole drone. You know, we were fighting that like low intensity, high frequency war. So they were able to make a lot of money. These private military contractors, a lot of, a lot of money. If you start to see the reports now from the United States being involved in Afghanistan, Iraq, there was something like however many, three trillion or something like half of that went to contractors and private corporations. Double check anything I say, don't, you know, take it. I'm just using using broad strokes in this. It was a bunch of money, huge amount of money and a bunch of it went to individuals who don't want to see that, that well dry up anytime soon. So even if we don't fight China, why don't we now start putting floaties on our big giant planes why don't we design hypersonic missiles that we just only time we use them is in practice um because they're doing the same thing that we're building all these things up knowing that we'll never use them against each other or if it ever did get to that point it's over for everybody so i don't know I don't know. I'm from from my standpoint is, you know, I understand that yeah, if your enemy is the mentality, well, if they're doing it, we got to do it. And that's where you get a lot of this stuff from. And a lot of it leads to this, but this is, you know, this is this is down the rabbit hole. Let's go. There's no answers here. We got to this is a bit of a pondering and wonder what it may mean. And we can discuss that at some other point. Depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, and anxiety, according to this article, share gut bacteria similarities. So, as you can imagine, they looked at a bunch of gut microbiome um, to see if there were any similarities. Now, they know that in individuals, uh, a number of recent studies have honed in on compelling associations between mental health and the microbiome. This insight into... I may be saying that word wrong. If I am, then don't make fun of me. These insights into strange, I'm just going to say bacteria for the future, of strange gut-brain connections that found links between depression and certain species of gut bacteria. One study even found symptoms of schizophrenia could be transferred from mouse to mouse via fecal transplants. I've always felt, you know, people talk about schizophrenia models in mice, and I think, you know, I'm not convinced that they're not seeing brain damage because some of the techniques used to mimic schizophrenia, I'm like, you're just damaging the brain, which is not necessarily schizophrenia. Brain damage and schizophrenia are two different things. And I'm not even sure that mice can hallucinate the same way that a human being. Do you know that the Greeks were Romans? Romans and Greeks, but I, th I think it was Romans, were phenomenal at documenting all of the mental illnesses because they just described what was around them. Depression, bipolar, anxiety, PTSD. Some people think that um, the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, is, describes Achilles suffering from PTSD when you read it uh, from you know, his friend dying and keeping the body for like a week to become a super depressed and not even participate. You know, it's, it's a bit of, you know, hey, anything you can make almost anything look like anything. But let me get I'm sorry to get to the point. The one thing that is not in any of that literature 
is psychotic disorder or sorry, the chronic psychotic disorders like we see today in um, such as schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. At Michigan, University of Michigan, they say schizoaffective disorder. Other places say schizoaffective disorder. Potato, potato. So the question was, did schizophrenia exist at that point? Because it was not noted in any of the writings from that time. While every other condition that we know of, even like obsessive compulsive disorder, can be picked up from the writings of that time. Something to think about. Anyway. So when they, this team of researchers looked at 59 case control studies tracking gut bacteria diversity in adults with a variety of different psychiatric disorders, they ultimately found that the microbiome, biome, 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 the gut signature is commonly shared by a number of different psychiatric conditions, in particular those experiencing depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia all displayed increased levels of a bacterium called Agarthelia, which had previously been linked to gastrointestinal inflammation. These four psychiatric conditions were also associated with decreased levels of Fuxiclobacterium and Coprococcus. Coccus. Coccus. No, not Coccus. <laughs> Coprococcus. Two bacterial genera known to confer anti inflammatory. So, long story short, the high, the Bacteria associated with increased inflammation was elevated in these individuals and those bacteria associated with anti-inflammatory properties were lower. And that's, I think we may have mentioned that before or said it, I get confused, but if not, we'll say it again, which is inflammation in the body is probably one of the biggest factors for poor health, be it diabetes, high blood pressure, thyroid problems, cancers. A lot of things can be traced back to problems with inflammation. And how do you get that? It can be a revved up system from just a a, a maladaptive way. Um, let me not even, okay, let me say it smarter, easier. An easier way to think of it is that if you don't know how to chill out, you can make yourself sick, basically. You got to learn how to just let it go. Let, let all the frustration, the anger, the attempts of control, let that go. Just be someone who can be more relaxed and, and, and roll with the punches with the universe, good and bad. But, you know, we're seeing these effects in the body. And, and, and there's going to be ways to target it at that. But I also think taking the ownership on how much control you have on your physical reality is very important as well with that said i love you you love you god loves us and that's all that matters